my Savior and nailed him to the cross. They crucified my Savior and nailed him to the cross. They crucified my Savior and nailed him to the cross. And the Lord shall bear my spirit home. Christian challenge can be twofold. We can be challenged by the life, message and power of Jesus Christ and so try and follow him. And having met that challenge, the faith which grows in us can in turn be challenged by doubts, by difficulties and by things which may seem senseless and evil. And it's only in living by faith that we can come through these experiences and continue to grow. For we can come through. Jesus has promised us that we shall not be tempted beyond what we are able to bear. And then there's another challenge, the challenge of the example we set on the lives of others. In our interlude this morning, we'll see these three challenges met and overcome in the short life of one man, Tom Dooley. He was a United States naval doctor who in 1954 was sent to North Vietnam to look after a refugee camp. What he saw there changed the direction of his life. Hugh Dixon and Edward Bishop will tell us the story of Tom Dooley. On a mountain slope in northern Laos, a bear lurched its way through the forest undergrowth into a clearing. Suddenly it stopped, reared up on its hind legs, and sniffed the air. A man stepped out from behind a tree, took aim, and fired. The bear fell to the ground. A boy ran forward. His father cried out, Take care, he's still alive. The boy laughed and shouted, He's dead and then threw himself to the ground beside the bear. Suddenly the animal cried out with pain, lifted a paw, and tore the boy's face from eye to chin. Another shot rang out. It killed the bear. The father ran up and took the screaming boy into his arms. Weeks later, the man carried his son down from their tribal settlement on the mountain to the village of Muang Sing, which lay in the valley not far from the point where Laos, China and Burma meet. The father asked to be directed to the house of Tom Dooley, the American doctor. By this time, the boy's face was a horrible sight. The upper jawbone was fractured. A large hole in the cheek was full of stinking pus. A witch doctor had made things worse by stuffing tobacco and monkey fur into the gaping wound. The American took the boy into his hospital. 
With the help of his staff, he cleaned the wound and treated it with germ-killing drugs. Later, under an anaesthetic, the remaining healthy tissue was drawn together and stitched to close the wound. The hospital where this was done was a simple structure. There was a clinic for outpatients. For those who needed prolonged nursing or an operation, a second hutment had been built. This was divided into three parts. In all, it was possible to nurse 30 patients, mostly stretched out on mats on the floor. But I'll tell you how it all started. In 1954, Tom Dooley, then a doctor in the US Navy, was sent to Japan on duty. He stayed there for a few weeks only and was then sent to North Vietnam. For a year, he worked in a refugee camp. While he was there, 600,000 wretched, homeless people passed through the camp. They had borne the brunt of the communist invasion of North Vietnam. Tom Dooley helped to meet the physical needs of those who had suffered injuries. He succored those who had collapsed under the strain of a nightmare journey as they fled from the communists. The US Navy moved no fewer than a million of these people to the southern city of Saigon. The horrifying sights which Tom Dooley saw in the refugee camp changed the direction of his whole life. If it hadn't been for this experience, he might well have settled down to the life of an orthopedic surgeon in St. Louis, Missouri. But Dooley had felt challenged to meet the needs of a people for whom nothing was more unlikely than that they would receive medical care. As Dooley himself pointed out. Yes, indeed, nothing was more unlikely than that. As a matter of fact, the possibility of curing sickness was an entirely new idea to the people of our high mountain village, Mong Sing. All their lives, the villagers had thought that it was impossible to be rid of malaria, rickets, goiter, dysentery, and the like. In my first hospital in Namtha, I was assisted by four helpers who had seen service in the medical section of the U.S. Navy. With funds supplied by the magazine Reader's Digest, and with drugs and surgical equipment which had been given to me by their manufacturers, we tried to show, with love, that we understood the responsibility of those who have to those who have not. Eventually, I was able to turn the Namtha Hospital over to the Laotian government. To our critics, I used to say, in America, doctors run 20th century hospitals. In Asia, I run a 19th century hospital. Upon my departure, the hospital may drop to the 18th century. Previously, the tribes in the high valleys lived, medically speaking, in the 15th century. After my tour of duty in Japan and North Vietnam, I decided to return home to America by way of Africa because I wanted to go to Lamborghini to meet the great Dr. Schweitzer. This man had turned his back on the fame which he had attained in Europe and had gone to care for sick people in the primeval forest. Dr. Schweitzer said many things which impressed me greatly, including these words. The significance of a man is not in what he attains, but in what he longs to attain. I said to myself, I must continue to long to attain, for an idea had been taking shape in my mind. I wanted to serve in Asia the people, the sick people, who had no possibility of being treated by anyone else. When I arrived back in the States, I met Dr. Peter Commanduras, a distinguished Washington physician, a man who shared Schweitzer's view that men belong to one another, that they are brothers. Peter and I talked about the dreams which we both had, to take care of sick folk who lived in areas where they had little or no chance of receiving medical aid. And so, as a result of these two men talking about their dreams, a new organization came into existence. It was called the Medical International Cooperation Organization. This title was shortened to Medico. Dr. Peter Comanduras went on a world tour to discover where Medico could most usefully operate. Dr. Tom Dooley went on a lecture tour in America to obtain three things, medicines, surgical equipment, and money. Although the work was started in Asia, it was agreed that Medico would go wherever a nation declared that a need existed within its borders. Dr. Dooley was always careful to emphasize that any hospital which Medico started was not an American hospital. 
He declared that the one at Muang Sing, for example, was a Laotian hospital, which Americans were running for a time. There, where Dooley himself worked, the local people were quick to avail themselves of the compassion and the healing which they found at the hospital. The patients were many and varied. On a fine morning, up to 160 would assemble. All who came were treated by Dooley and his staff. Wherever possible, the treatments and the injections were given by young villagers who had been trained for these tasks. Dr. Tom Dooley was a Christian, a Catholic. His patients were mostly Buddhists, but he made no attempt to convert them. But the quality of his life, the completeness of his dedication to the work of meeting their needs, impressed them and awakened their love. It sounds an ideal story of a Christian medical missionary, doesn't it? But a time came when Dooley's life was to change direction yet again. This time he was challenged in quite a different way. Tom Dooley contracted an incurable form of cancer. Why should a man like Tom Dooley become the victim of such pain at the very moment when by his dedicated life he's bringing help and consolation to underprivileged people whose need is so great? And how is it that the Tom Dooleys of this world are able to bear fierce, unrelenting pain and bear it with courage? Tom Dooley's answer would be, because I have faith. He entered a New York hospital for the cancer operation. The room in which he was placed had been transformed into a television studio. For some time past, a producer of documentaries had wanted to make a film which would present the true facts about cancer to the public. Tom Dooley had agreed to cooperate in making an unrehearsed documentary which would include shots of the patient under treatment and during the operation itself. Why did Dooley agree to do this? Well, that I can explain easily. The minute people hear the word cancer, they think of gloom, doom, and death. This makes folk mentally crippled even before they get to the hospital. It puts them in a bad frame of mind before surgery. The second reason was this. I wanted this chance to talk to some 20 to 25 million Americans about the work of Medico. Early on the morning of the operation, the priest came to bring me Holy Communion. I wondered then, as I so often do, how do people live without faith? In whose hands can they put themselves at a time like this? After Holy Communion, I had a few moments of thanksgiving and felt more serene, safer, stronger. I was in his hands, holy and in resignation. Peace of soul and body flowed over me, a deep, warm peace. I was ready. A month after his operation, Tom Dooley left hospital. It was now September 1960. On October the 10th, he started another lecture tour on behalf of Medico. By Christmas, he was back at his hospital in Wong Sing. But he soon realized that he lacked what he called the old get up and go. In spite of this, he undertook further trips. In Rome, he was received in private audience by the Pope. He returned to Laos. But by now, the cancer had invaded his entire body. On Christmas morning, 1960, he received Holy Communion for the last time. He was flown back to New York and entered hospital. There, on the 18th of January, he died. He was 34. At the funeral service, over 2,000 people filled the cathedral at St. Louis. Years before, Albert Schweitzer had said to Tom Dooley, You will always have happiness if you seek and find how to serve. And now our prayers. O oh God, thank you for the life, work, and example of Tom Dooley, and for all who heal where need is greatest. 
Amen. We'll say together the prayer of dedication. It begins, O Jesus, friend of the friendless. O Jesus, friend of the friendless, helper of the poor, healer of the sick, whose life was spent in doing good, help us to follow in thy footsteps. Make us strong to do right, gentle with the weak, and kind to all who are in sorrow, that we may be like thee, our Lord and Master. Amen. We'll close our act of worship by saying together the grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Hero, hero, hero.